Okay. Thank you very much, Carl Widerquist. That was a brilliant presentation and a great setup for the Q&A discussion that's going to follow. Um, to join Carl up on stage, we've got Dr. Elizabeth Hill from Sydney University's Department of Political Economy. Um, Liz's research focus on the political economy of gender, work and care, with a particular focus on the Asia-Pacific region and also developing countries. Uh, Professor Gabrielle Ma from Macquarie University's Department of Sociology and Gabrielle's research is organised around a set of questions about how care work and social uh, services are distributed, organised and valued. And again, a very relevant topic when we're talking about a universal basic income. Um, so how this is going to work is we'll have two microphones. Uh, Troy and Ben are going to be at the bottom of both of those staircases. Um, once we open up the questions, uh, just come down to the top of the staircase and get in a queue and we'll go from one side to the other and take the questions as we go. Um, to kick us off, I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the first question. Uh, and, and really that's, how do you think in terms of gender relations that a universal basic income could address some of the persistent and large pay gap that we've seen between men and women? And that's open to, to all of you. There's a lot of literature from a feminist perspective on the UBI, um, and particularly addressing the question that Carl raised at the beginning, um, or, or the proposition that a UBI is um, about promoting freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but within, the fem within feminist scholarship and within feminist activism, there's um, a split as to whether the UBI will or won't promote um, freedom for for women, whether it will or it won't transform gender relations. Um, and the debate runs quite deep. Um, there are those who argue that the UBI is a fantastic idea because here we have uh, a method of reshaping our tax and transfer schemes, our, social our approach to social policy that allows for the valuation of particularly unpaid care work and unpaid domestic work, the stuff that makes possible the market-based um, economy. So there's a, this idea that, in fact, a UBI will mitigate the care penalty that so many, or which every woman, um, uh, experiences as a result of their capacity to be both a worker and for many women to be also um, parents and there's a knock-on effect to other women in the economy as it turns out if you look at the macro data. So there's this um, proposition that by valuing care will then women gain some kind of freedom, that by valuing care there's also this possibility of reconfiguring gender relations and that men when um, care is valued and unpaid domestic work is valued, well they may actually choose to step back from paid work in the marketplace. So that's the kind of ideal and the notion of freedom that's um, embodied with the, uh, in the UBI from one point of view. The other point of view within feminist scholarship and activism of, of, is of course that um, a UBI and valuing, as it were, care work will just lead to further entrenchment of women um, doing unpaid care work and unpaid um, domestic work. And there's a lot of reason um, to uh, stand on that side of the, the, of the argument, I think. So a couple of thoughts. Um, in Michael Bittman's work on time use um, around the world, his conclusion is that gender trumps dollars. Gender trumps money. So in his um, very detailed work, looking at the way in which uh, movement between paid work and unpaid work pans out, that in fact, even when uh, women do enter the paid workforce, uh, men's work in the home and in care work doesn't actually completely um, moderate that movement. And in fact, women end up doing, um, on the whole, a total amount of labour, much more than men in terms of paid and, and unpaid. I think the other thing that we have to look at in Australia to try and get a sense of what may or may not happen is to think about the current policies we have in place that actually do provide for some paid time out of the workforce. So if we look at the um, provision for dad and partner pay in the National Paid Parental Scheme, which still has managed to survive, um, 
The evaluation of that demonstrates that very few men take that up. And why do they take that up? Because it's paid at a minimum wage. And in all the literature on UBI, UBIs, the level at which the UBI would be paid is not, and, and Carl spoke to this in, in this quote here, it's not at a, very, a particularly high level. It's a contribution. So men aren't particularly... Well, you could argue that men aren't particularly stupid, and so they choose not to forego their highly paid market work and move into lower paid um, care work. So I think that... Is one, it gives us a little insight into how this may play out if it was ever implemented in Australia. The other um, piece of policy that um, gives us a bit of an idea about that is um, the right to request a change in working hours. So in Australia, as in some other um, economies in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a right to request a change in our working hours, for, particularly for care work, but also for other kinds of non-market-based work. And we find that very few men take that work up. So I think obviously the jury's still out on which way um, a UBI would play in terms of um, the gender distribution of paid and unpaid um, work, but I'm, I find it hard to um, line up beside those um, feminist scholars who see this as um, a great new kind of future and uh, a, a new form of social policy that's really going to um, provide new forms of freedom for women, I'm much more sceptical as to how that might play out. And I think in the end I side with Michael Bittman that gender probably will trump dollars. Beautiful, Liz. Um, <laughs> I, I would just, I guess I would, I don't have much to add to that except to say that I guess the two questions that f uh, femini feminists pose for um, the idea of basic income, uh, how, what is the mechanism by which it is going to actually equalise the currently unequal distribution of domestic and caring work, and how will it deal with existing inequalities in the distribution of opportunities to get more? So opportunities to get more to these days are structured heavily towards men getting more of the more. So across all domains of social life. So how would that change if you just raise the floor? Why won't men still get more of the more and end up being economically uh, more advantaged than women? It's, it's not clear that there's anything in the mechanism of the basic income that could address that issue just by its introduction. So I guess the issue there is, is what is the suite of other kinds of um, measures that would need to be in place to avoid the replication of existing gendered inequalities. Um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Carl, did you have uh, anything to add on that? Topic? Yeah, basic income is not a panacea. It's not going to build you a light rail system. It's, it's not going to... Uh, <laughs> It's not going to uh, people. It's not going to end uh, people from drinking too much soda or something like that. It, but um, and it it it's certainly not going to uh, uh, not going to address the problem of, of why so many of our uh, top executives are male and uh, and female. At least not in a in a big and significant way. Um, and uh, the extent that it addresses is that is that. Uh, it addresses one thing very directly, is that the poorest people in the United States and in most other uh, Western industrialized nations tend to be single parents with children, especially single mothers with children. Uh, especially, worse, uh, especially worse for single mothers often because they're channeled into pink collar jobs which are lower paying. Now, I don't think basic income will solve all of that, but I know that more power in the hands of the worker is always good for the worker. So it is likely to get fewer women ghettoized into pink collar jobs um, and, uh, uh, and higher pay for those jobs that single mothers tend to be in and it give them more power to demand things like flex labor. So I, I, I know that it will be good for women and good, good for women in those conditions, it's less likely to solve the problem at the higher end where the best jobs go for women. But what's going on there I think is a problem that we need to look at is that you tend to see, you tend to see uh, women you tend to see women and men as they, uh, at, a, at, at about similar trajectories at some parts of their career and then women dropping out 
uh, to, of the labor force to raise children, and then by the time they go back in, way, when are may, men are way ahead, and this accounts for a lot of the men dominating the highest things, and women are dropping out for two, three, five years or something like that. And I actually saw economists talking about this at uh, the, uh, uh, I think it was the Eastern Economics Association Conference in the U.S., talking about this, saying, oh, well, I have no problem with this as long as women are choosing this. They're not really thinking very deeply about it because, okay, so women, so you have a career that spans 40 years and women are dropping out for three to five years. Now, what is it that these men are learning in that three to five year period that accounts for some of them being CEOs making $5 million a year and, so, and, and the next person being, being a mid-level person making, making in the low six figures? There's nothing possible they can learn. It is about cueing and showing the boss that you're the go-getter. And you can't be a go-getter unless either you have no children or you have a, a, a spouse, and by I mean a spouse, I mean generally a wife, uh, a wife at home doing your child rearing for him. That's what we expect in our queuing. I don't think basic income solves that. We need other policies to address that. Yeah, look, I, I guess um, it, I, I'm, I'm glad that, um, that, that uh, you, the, you know, in, that in the basic income discourse, there's recognition that there's other policies required as well. But I guess they can, they are also in competition for resources for a basic income. And, and this is something that you have addressed about whether mm -hmm. pr provision of universal services mm -hmm. is an alternative to the basic income and how the balance might be achieved between spending on services and spending mm -hmm. on uh, income support. I guess. I guess I think, I mean, in a way, we had a basic income for single mothers in Australia until a few years ago. We had for decades a basic mm -hmm. income for single mothers, and it didn't really do a lot to solve their problems. Um, and in a, in a way, it's it, 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 not that the, which was the supporting parents' pension. And turning that now into having single mothers go on a conditional benefit of the unemployment benefit just is just a, um, makes that more difficult. But the single mother's pension, I think, in a way, while it was a, while it had a very humane origins, in the end, I'm not sure that it helped the cause of women workers in Australia and and necessarily helped single mothers in the way that they, to improve their lives as much as possible. So, it, in a sense, that's an experiment in the basic income for single mothers that didn't it, it saved them from starving, but probably not much more than that. Just two things. One, women and men's labour market experience um, is much more complex and sophisticated than you just um, laid out. Oh, well, yeah. So that, that's <laughs> but I'm not gonna, we, yeah, won't, course, we won't yeah, have yeah. that conversation. The, the Th point those I are two big problems. I, I didn't, I, if I made it sound like those are the only problems, then, then, then I badly misspoke. Yeah. But um, the main thing I want to say is that context is really important. So if we're thinking about um, basic incomes in emerging economies, the situation is quite different. And so Guy Standing and some of um, my union colleagues in India who have been part of a very large pilot program in northern in India, in Madhya Pradesh. And the outcome of that experiment um, is absolutely uh, the, the generation of significant and substantive forms of freedom for women, for men, for children, for communities. And so we really need to be mindful of the interaction between a UBI and other social, um, social policies. And the way a UBI plays out in a context where there is uh, an incredibly immature, if even non-existent, um, uh, social, social security um, kind of context. It's very different there compared to here. Um, so in the Indian case, you have incredible benefits to child nutrition, to education rates, to housing, to health care, because these are people who are living in rural India where jobs are very few. There's been very low investment in the rural sector in India for the past decade. And um, the labour market is extremely degraded. And so a UBI is a complete boon um, to these communities. And the success of that pilot has been so significant that in the, uh, the recent um, uh, budget papers, the Indian government has foreshadowed that it's seriously considering the introduction of a national UBI. So context really, really matters. Um, but it is something that is playing out in both the developing and the, and the post-industrial world. Well, uh, just to respond, I'm not familiar with the uh, with the, the the policy you were talking about. You said we had a basic income for women from the uh, uh, from the facial expressions of some of the uh, basic income supporters I know in the crowd. Uh, I'm 
uh, getting the impression it was actually very far from basic income. People often say, oh, this was a basic income when actually they're not that familiar with the basic income policy and actually the thing they're talking about is very far from a basic income. If you actually had a basic income for women or even just for mothers, uh, I would be extremely surprised and it would be a very strange policy. You're giving women, say, uh, you're giving women and not men uh, an income whether or not they work, including if they work, you're giving them an income high enough to keep them out of poverty and they get to keep that when they take their job whereas men don't get that, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be big news. And, that would be, and I, I, don't, I really don't think that's how the policy works. It was probably actually very far from the basic income model. Okay. Well, let's, um, I didn't think that question was going to go quite that long, but mm -hmm. uh, this, this man has been very patient. He was up first, so we'll start on Ben's side. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk and the comments. Um, you, you made a lot of arguments about why UBI is... Uh, practical, it's doable, it's moral, and let's say everybody is convinced mm -hmm. and we implement it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What do you think will be the main differences in our world? Let's say it's, it's a universal thing in all, all of the world. What will change the world in one year, in 10 years, and in 50 years? Can, can you paint a picture how you think this is going to uh, pan out? And that's a question for all of you, I guess. Yeah, to me, I, I think the most, uh, you know, a lot of that is, is it can only be told by experience. Um, but I think there are, at least some things are strong indications from what we know from other markets, is that, is that wages for the least desirable jobs are going to go way up. Um, working conditions for the least desirable jobs are going to go way up. Um, the ability for workers well up in the middle class to command, to command uh, shorter hours and, and, and longer vacation is going to go way up. Uh, those things, are, I think, are very important. From some of the experimental data, we can expect that the ghettoization of poverty is going to decrease, that infant mortality is going to decrease, that low birth weight babies is going to decrease, that even they found evidence in, in Canada when they, when they had an entire town that was eligible for a guaranteed minimum income very similar to basic income, that they even found that incidents of, incidents of spousal abuse decrease and that, and that uh, uh, psychiatric emergencies at the local hospital decrease. So I think there will be many an important and very tangible immediate gains that we shared widely across the economy. What else will happen? I don't know. There's so much, there's so much more that can. Um, look, I guess one issue would be who, if it didn't, if it wasn't decided by a world government that everyone could get on the same day. Um, the dynamic effects, of, it, it, the dynamic effects on on uh, people movement and things like that, and would be difficult to predict. So, if the if the bidding price of very low paid jobs it could it could go up, or people could come from other countries who were willing to do it, if if people were willing to take the basic income, and then those jobs either wouldn't get done, or the employers would find other people to do them. So the concept of, so the issue of citizenship and sometimes the basic income, I guess, talked about is a, is a citizen's income. Who is eligible for it? Who, which, which taxpayers pay for which populations to get the basic income if the, if the bottom, if, if the floor is raised in the labour market and so on would be an interesting question. So I think there's, I think thinking about the dynamic effects of introducing such a, a measure how it could be, how it would be contained and managed within different jurisdictions. How people movement could be managed. What would happen to the economy if certain kinds of jobs just weren't, people weren't willing to do them anymore? Um, it would be hard to predict how it would unfold, and you know, it, including even the erosion of the tax base to pay for the basic income. So, I think there's lots of, you know, lots of sort of a compar comparing. I think when it's difficult to have a static conception of what, what something like this would cost because the impact on the economy is quite difficult to predict. So that's not a reason for not doing it or what have you, but, but I think experiments in towns or regions don't replicate the possible macroeconomic impacts and so they may give a, uh, an incomplete impression of what might happen um, 
not so much the people. I mm -hmm. accept I accept the mm -hmm. accounts that you've given of the mm -hmm. positive benefits for mm -hmm. the people who get it. But what might happen more broadly in the economy could be hard to predict. To my mind, the most positive um, outcome would be um, the respect that it would deliver to everybody and the destigmatisation, particularly of those who receive um, benefits and income support of all, all types. So, to my mind, that, that is a huge beneficial outcome that actually changes significantly or has the potential to change significantly the way we interact as citizens with one another. Um, and the flip side of that, which a lot of us might think is a, um, a benefit, would be the reduction of um, the bureaucracy and the kind of um, the pernicious bureaucracy that is required to administer means-tested, uh, activity-based forms of social security. Um, and we all um, know, or well, many of us will know, or have been in a situation where you have to interact. Not to say those people are bad, but those jobs are, are horrible jobs. And I mean, the, the, the movie um, I, Daniel Blake, really kind of spoke to the dehumanising impact on the people that sat in those jobs to administer those programs. So I think the, gen the capacity to raise the general level of respect between citizens, um, for me, that's something that uh, I see as a, a really positive potential for a UBI. Yeah, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I just wondered what your view on inherited wealth is and what's the relationship, if there is a relationship, between inherited wealth and universal um, income, basic income. Well, I... Uh, uh, to me, it's not specifically inherited wealth. Um, that is, that is uh, something that people tend to focus on, but it's the idea that, that, that uh, whether you inherited, or inherited it or you, or you just got it yesterday, um, all wealth is made partially out of resources, and all those resources were here before us. If you, got, if you own resources, you, owe the, you own them for one and only one reason, because a government asserted power over that land and said, we're going to make these into private property, and they gave them to somebody who gave them to somebody who gave them to you. Now, whether that person was your grandfather and you inherited them, or that person was... Uh, that person was uh, uh, your sugar daddy, and uh, your sugar daddy, and they gave it to them because you're so good looking. Or whether, uh, or whether that person uh, uh, that you're an you're an airplane pilot and you worked very hard flying their plane, polluting our atmosphere, uh, polluting our atmosphere because they did. Um, you still own resources because the government inserted control and put everyone else under the duty the obligation to respect your, your resources about it, your, your control of those resources. That, I see, is the root of the problem, not so much, not so much inheritance of that. Now, it, inheritance, I think, does, it, it does, it, it does exacerbate it and, 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 make it and make it worse when you get dynastic families controlling the same resources for hundreds and hundreds of years, and that the, the returns on that wealth compounding and compounding for hundreds of years. But an inheritance tax is maybe not the best way to go about it. I think there are, there are other taxes that do the same thing as inheritance tax. Inheritance tax takes a huge chunk when you die, whereas a wealth tax checks takes a little chunk every year. Uh, I think that's a much better way to do it. It doesn't, gal it doesn't pick a big gouge out of the family fortune. It takes a little, little bit every time, and it's not, not dependent on uh, this family died in a neat order, and this family, uh, the grandfather outlived the father, and so this one pays half the taxes of that one. Does it, doesn't, it's uh, a wealth tax is better, or, or, or a resource value tax, or a, or, or, uh, a rental value tax that taxes on actually the value of the resources you own. These are other ways to get at the same things that uh, an inheritance tax does without some of the, of the, our, uh, of the problems that an inheritance tax does. Hi. Um, I love the idea of universal basic income. Bring it on tomorrow. Except I had this thought recently, um, particularly around what's happening with vaccinations in Australia. I know everybody will groan at me. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, with, them, with the government now saying that they will withhold certain parenting payments from parents who refuse to vaccinate their child. This is my concern, is of the... Like, on the one side, there's the freedom, but on the other side, then there's this opportunity for actual 
you know, controlling what we do with our bodies and we might not pay you. So I'd just like some comments based on that. I mean, the idea of a universal basic income is that it's, non, it's unconditional. Um, but there are a variety of um, cash payments. And so, you know, the universal basic income sits within um, a group of other payments like conditional cash transfers that, um, that were developed. Or oh, There's a lot of them in Latin America and they had very strong conditions attached to them um, that often had to be uh, met by mothers. So the question of whose freedom is really important as lo when there's conditionality. And conditionality is a really key issue and I'm sure Carl will um, be advocating a UBA that is universal with no conditions attached. But you're right, um, there's always this tension if the state is providing, then will that when will they decide that they want to attach some conditions to those? And um, from a gender point of view, that's been a really negative story. Yeah, yeah. I, um, uh, it's funny. The, the three of you have one mic, and I have one mic. I don't know. How to that, but, um, You're that, the guest. That, um, I, I think uh, a really bad way to get, to get people to do something is to, to, to threaten them with, with poverty if you don't do it. You say, okay, we'll take some off your basic income if you don't do this, that, and the other thing. We're saying, well, you're saying, we're going to threaten you with poverty if you don't, if the basic income's at the poverty level. We're going to threaten you to poverty if you don't do this. And it's very tempting for the middle and upper classes to do this because it's often very easy for them to fulfill the conditions and they always think that they know better what's good for the poor and that they can make better decisions for the poor even though they've never been poor and they don't know what it's like to be poor they always want to make decisions so I think we need to stay very clear about that and there's other ways to make sure that uh, that people uh, do the things we need to do like like vaccinate their children uh, or get a or, 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 or get a monthly checkup or whatever it is. Um, my question is to you, Carl. Uh, first, to comment and to apologise as an Australian where um, I live in a country where I believe our government uh, thinks that the, um, the people choose to be the working poor or the unworking oh, poor. I'm from America, so you don't need to apologise yeah. to me. Well, <laughs> we can all commiserate with that. Um, my concern is that in the long term, artificial intelligence technology will create a whole change where the Industrial Revolution did need labour, um, that we are entering permanently a change where labour is not uh, really uh, required and the governments can't provide full employment and I think we're already seeing that now. Um, so to keep an economy active, I would expect that we would need all consumers to be engaged in, the, uh, in an economy. And this might be uh, uh, one of the arguments uh, for neoliberals to seriously consider a universal tax. What I'm asking you for, uh, desperately, is um, are any ideas about how to change neoliberal thinking so that they realise that we all need to be active uh, participants in an economy and that the Mad Max scenario in Australia or in the US is, is not one we would want for our societies. Uh, how to change people thinking is, is something that I've never, I haven't worried about since, uh, since I was in my 20s in the 1980s. Somebody told me, like, you just got all these ideas, you gotta, you gotta stop worrying about whether anybody's gonna pay any attention and just, just write up your ideas and see, we just let what happens may. And that's, I've been following that advice ever since and it's worked out for me great. I was, I was minding my own business, right? I've been writing about this obscure topic about basic income for 20 years. Uh, and then for reasons that have nothing to do with me, it ta it's taken off in the last few years. And then, uh, then some people like the Atlantic Monthly have like, given me credit as if it's my fault. I don't know. I wasn't doing anything. Uh, so I, I don't know how. To, all I knew how to do was to say what I believe. 
whether that's a, g a good way to sell it or not, I don't know. But what I do know is that there are lots and lots of people around the world arguing for basic income in very different ways. And some, some are contradictory ways. But I think that's the way that a movement like this has to develop. It's like people need to go out and make all these different arguments and see which one catches on. Now, that artificial intelligence argument is really catching on right now. That's exciting a lot of people, especially uh, in the, the futurists and the tech people in the US. But I, I've got... And, and, uh, and mostly, the, the, and it's the farthest flung one of those ideas that's really catching on is the idea that maybe these machines are going to someday replace all human labor. I don't think that's, and a lot of people dismiss that as a crazy idea. I don't think it's a crazy idea. People think it's crazy because it's never happened. Well, uh, uh, well uh, uh, machines had never replaced all, uh, all, 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 all horses as of 1910. Uh, there were more horses with jobs in 1910 than ever before in history. Then by 1920, almost every horse, except for like a, like a racehorse or a handsome, handsome cab uh, driver, was out of a job. Um, so it could happen. This, this idea of uh, machines replacing all human labor could happen. But the thing is, I don't want to rest my argument or even very much focus my argument on that because that gives people to say, well, okay, well, let's wait and see if that happens. And then if it does, then let's have basic income. But the thing is, there are automation-based ideas, uh, reasons to have basic income right now. One I mentioned in this talk, uh, which is that in the last 40 years, we've had tremendous amount of automation which has made it possible for all of us to work less and get more income, and we've gotten neither. So we need it to get our share of the automation that we've already helped create. So that, that's one here and now argument why we need basic income now because of automation. But another one is, is that one thing it does, whether ultimately it gives you more jobs or not, what it does is it disrupts the labor market. And it disrupts the labor market uh, in ways that make the people that, that do the things that we've told them over and over again you have to do to be a worthy person uh, that disrupts their jobs. You spend your life building up a skill. And then, because of automation, that skill is taken away. And this goes back hundreds of years, people are recognizing this. We had the Luddite movement 200 years ago, where, where textile workers who were being replaced by machine weaving were going around smashing textile mills. And people thought, look at these crazy people, they're against progress. They weren't against progress, they were against having their middle class jobs taken away and throwing them down into the lowest level of labor in society, which, which was very much at a deep poverty wage there in the early 1800s. It wasn't about whether someday there will be no jobs. It was about taking away the skills I build up and making them worthless. It does that every time. And maybe the next generation recovers. Maybe it doesn't. But the generation that happens to seldom does. If we replace all truck drivers with automated, automated self-driving truck. We're very likely to do. Those people who are driving trucks right now, are, their incomes are never going to recover. We need basic income to give a cushion to these people and stuff like that. It's the automation argument. It's a matter of here and now argument, whether it's going to replace all future jobs or not. Okay. Thank you for a brilliant uh, presentation and discussion. Um, my question is that it strikes me that the devil is in the details, and it's always made me uncomfortable that both conservatives and progressives seem to like UBI, but I don't think they're talking about the same thing. It strikes me that a $4,000 a year UBI is a very different thing than a $40,000 a year UBI. So I have a request, which is, can we distinguish between the two when we're talking about it? A UBI could refer to the minimalist approach, and what we're talking about as progressives is a maximal approach, a universal basic living income around $40,000. So, um, so my question to you is about the details. What's the proper price and is there a price below which it's not actually worth doing because conservatives are just going to use it as a tool to further dismantle the social safety net? Yeah, this is actually, this is... 
Uh, one of the biggest internal debates within the basic income movement right now. Now, the definition I gave you says uh, sufficient for necessaries. Notice that's the only archaic word in there. We'd say necessities today. Now, um, uh, an income sufficient for necessities. Um, I think that is, it, it's, it's not truly the basic income I want unless it's large enough for that. Um, and uh, there is a movement within the basic, this is not part of BN's basic, in, uh, BN, the basic income earth network. And their definition of basic income does not say anything about how large it is, just that it's a universal and unconditional payment uh, uh, on an individual basis in cash. Uh, now, but there's a movement saying it's got to be enough that you can live on or live in dignity or whatever. This is certainly the one I want, whether the other should be called basic income or not. But my position on this is that I, I, I agree that the devil is in the details. And a matter of fact, the person to read on that is Jürgen de Vispelar. Jürgen de Vispelar, this uh, basic income people have been saying for uh, 60 years, uh, it's simpler, it's simpler, it's simpler. And Jürgen de Vispelar says, well, you actually look at implementing it. Actually, it's a lot of complications here. He's got paper after your paper about these different aspects. Now, but about the size of it, uh, about the size that whether a small, what, what is sometimes called, sometimes we will say that one large enough to live on is a full basic income, another one is a partial basic income. I kind of like those terms. That a partial basic income, whether that is a step in the right direction or a step in the wrong direction, depend, that very much depends on the details. I think if you have one that is too small to live on, then you really can't cut much of anything else before you put it in. If, uh, if a neoliberal person comes, comes up and says, let's cancel the welfare state and give everybody 4,000 Australian dollars a year in a basic income, yeah, that's a bad move. That's going to be counterproductive for a lot of really needy people. It, it's actually, it's going to be good for some people because they're, well, I don't know about in Australia, but in the U.S., there are people who are eligible for basically nothing. And we actually, that would even be better for some people, but we'd be awfully bad for an awful lot of people living on the margins and on the net would hurt more people. Than but Alaska has small basic income of one to $2,000 a year for every man, woman, and child, which they introduce without cutting any other welfare program. And they don't even think of it as a welfare program. And I've done some studies on that. And it is, I can say pretty much unequivocally, that is a step in the right direction. So a small one, I think, is OK as long as you're not cutting out of the thing. But if somebody says, well, we're not going to give you this, we're going to cut everything else and give you this really small thing, yeah, that's a bad deal. Don't take it. I agree with that. <laughs> I don't think many people would argue against that. Um, let's take one from this side. What did you say to read? I couldn't hear you. Uh, oh, Jürgen de Vespilar, which, if you anglicize that, it's Jürgen de uh, Wispelier. Uh, it's got a, adult, it's a Belgian name. Uh, uh, I'm Carl Weiterquist. Uh, <laughs> If you ask me how to spell his name, t t I can tell you. Just email me. I I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah, you can find his name, yeah. Uh, thanks, Carl, for your presentation. Um, I'm also interested, very interested in the uh, universal basic income debate. Uh, my concern is that uh, it seems to be very much focused on the social issue of the distribution of wealth but not the environmental issue of how that wealth is generated. And uh, connecting some of these other arguments about the future of work and um, uh, how the energy system and the food system and the water system are all being transformed, disrupted at the moment, and uh, uh, we're, we're looking at a shift from centralised to distributed systems and the local provision of those basic needs. Um, how do you see... Um, the, the universal basic income debate connecting in with the direct provision of basic needs through ideas like the circular economy, distributed renewable energy, local harvesting of water and food, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing most of the talking lately. Did you two want to start with this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> so, like, we've... Uh, well... There are two issues there, I think, with the, the environmental issue. One of the things you were saying about people doing different distribution. I think the important thing basic income does there for people who want to, not just to uh, 
leave their job and just, and just spend their income on their own stuff, but actually want to leave their job and start some uh, non-capitalist cooperative enterprise that is going to use resources in a more sustainable way, what basic income does is give people power to get some resources to do things in that way. So I think basic income definitely furthers things on that end, gives people power to do that. They don't have to work for 20 years to save up just to get the chance to try something like that. So that end, I think it's very good. There's another end of basic income that we haven't talked about. We've talked about uh, inheritance tax finance, wealth tax finance, income tax finance, and, uh, uh, and uh, land value tax finance or resource tax finance. One thing that is doing a lot in the basic income movement now, one of the reasons it's taking off so much in the world now is, is very different people are talking about it. We talked about the tech entrepreneurs and, the, and uh, people advocating against inequality, but also there's a lot of environmentalists that are behind it almost as, uh, almost as a bonus to their strategy of fighting, their strategy of, of, uh, of fighting pollution and degradation. Because, because what people are doing is they're using the environment as a trash can, as a giant trash can, and they're not even paying for it. They're using up the valuable resources of the ground, turning in the trash that is polluting our rivers and our ground and our air. They haven't paid a cent for it. Now, uh, people are, well, if you start charging them for it, people are going to want to sell more, and that's just going to be going, no, we need to assert control over our resources. When you can assert the power to, to charge for things, you are asserting ownership and the right to regulate. There's this movement called the tax and dividend movement. So we're going to start taxing people for any kind of pollution they're doing, whether it's greenhouse gases or whether it's polluting our rivers or whatever else. We're going to tax them for it. We're going to say how much you've got to pay for this. And those taxes themselves discourage doing all these bad things. And people say, well, but if you tax, that takes money out of the economy, and it's a drag in the economy. Oh, well, we'll put the money back into the economy with a dividend. So tax and dividend. Well, that dividend's a basic income. So the basic income there is what that does is that by effectively, you take it out of the polluting things and then giving back to people to spend on whatever they want, effectively, you're making things that pollute more expensive and everything else less expensive effectively, because you're letting people, uh, you're, you're giving people more money to buy on the non, and, uh, and while the price of the polluting thing goes up, that's going to bid down the price of the non-polluting things. So a tax and dividend strategy incorporates a basic income, really is just a way to make this, to make this taxation do what it needs to do uh, to discourage pollution without being an overall drag on the economy. It's merely a shifting in the economy from the polluting things to the non-polluting things. There, I think basic income is a part of a very important environmental strategy. Can I just jump in with a yeah. follow-up related to that? What about this idea of a universal basic grant versus yeah. an income? Because what we're talking about there is the potential for capital cost up front to get mm -hmm. long-term sustainable benefits for a community. Would it be better to be, give people, as some schemes are trying in developing countries, the cash up front rather than as a continuous income? Um, I, I uh, am, I mean, cash up front is good, but I think it's more, <laughs> it's more important that people have enough to live on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the way I compare that to, uh, I compare that to a trapeze artist. Uh, you want to do it, you want to get a, a trapeze artist to do more interesting trips, uh, tricks and more bigger somersaults or whatever. Which is, which is going to get them to try more daring things? Get them better, uh, better swinging trapeze, you know, a better platform and all this stuff up here, or to put a net under them to make sure they're not going to die if they screw it up. Because what you have in the, in the poorest countries is that people are desperate to get meals for the next day. People are so caught up with keeping themselves and their families out of malnutrition that they can't think very far ahead. Yet a big grant at one time can give them that cushion for a little bit and then give them some money to invest. But you take away that continual fear that I don't have enough to eat, that already does a lot to get you up. Now, if you want to give them a, a big capital bonus now and then or something on top of that, that's fine, but also maybe an income that's, that's, that's a decent cushion above just enough to survive. They can, if they find it valuable, they could save that up uh, to give them a big chunk at one time or another. So I really think the most important thing is to first make people's basic needs. 
I agreed with that uh, guy that the devil really is in the details. And I was hoping you could clarify on how you arrived at uh, some of the costs. Uh, you mentioned two point something percent of GDP. And I think, is the, can you clarify, is the study that you, this is the one you did this year, mm -hmm. I assume, where you set the basic income at the poverty level at $12,000 for adults and $6,000 for children. That's with a tax rate of 50%. Yes, um, that's the one. Oh, well, okay. you've read it. Very yeah. cool. Um, but I wanted to know whether that, that amount would kind of do the things you were talking about before in terms of giving people a lot of freedom. And the other part of the cost that I was wondering if you know of any studies that look into is when wages for low-paid jobs increase, as they would have to, um, if those increases can't be borne by the private sector if they make uh, pay those wages unprofitable, will the government um, pay that difference and have you factored that into the costs of UBI as if well? If it makes some, some sectors of the economy un unprofitable. If, yeah. say, a low-paid job, if yeah. the wage to incentivise people to take that job goes up above a wage that a company can pay without losing money, basically. Yeah. Um, the, uh, okay, uh, 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 ask me your question uh, afterwards, when, when it's over, okay. Uh, so, um, well, um, the, if it makes jobs on, uh, on, on, on uh, some sectors of the economy unprofitable, uh, that I side with Franklin Roosevelt, who said, if, you're, if your business model requires you to pay poverty wages, I'm paraphrasing here because I can't memorize this, but he said something effective, if your business model requires paying poverty wages, then we don't want you doing your business in our country. We don't want you even importing your stuff into our country. Uh, no, we, we should not have businesses. If, if, if a business only profitable, if you can get people to work for poverty wages, then it's not a desirable business. It's not a good use of human labor. Then we really don't want the products of that business enough. If you're a consumer and you, you must not want something very much if you'll only buy it, if, if it can be produced only with, with, with uh, poverty wage labor. Let's just not produce those things. If we really want them, we'll pay up for them. Uh, you know, they, 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 yeah, uh, uh, you know uh, if you want something, you will pay for it. If you want it bad enough, you'll pay for it. Um, and uh, so I don't think we should have, uh, I don't think we should have uh, any uh, we, don't, we, we shouldn't have uh, any remorse for businesses like that that go out of business. And did you... Well, if we need it, we'll pay more for it. You can't, you know. But there what? are things that are expensive that we can't pay for, like health care and child care and care for older people and care for people with disabilities and things like that that are inherently expensive. Yeah. And that people can't pay for out of a private income and certainly can't pay for it out of a basic income. Oh, uh, um, I, 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 there are market failures. He was t I, I understood that he was talking about low-wage industries where he wanted to keep the wages low. Um, but uh, uh, well, as I said before, basic income doesn't solve all the problems in the world. There are some things that need to be provided in other ways. And the, I think if the problem is people not having just enough money, basic in, that's the one that basic income addresses, that someone is in poverty. But there are other things. If a market has what economists call market failures in it, then it, might, it needs some other kind of regulation to get rid of that market failure, and it could be a different kind of regulation for it. Now, uh, I believe the evidence is very good that, that uh, a national health system works a lot better than a private health system. The fact that the United States pays twice as much as about every other industrialized country and doesn't get any better health outcomes, I think, is, is, is one is one good piece of evidence that we have some market failure there and that a national health care is a better system. I don't think that has anything to do with basic income. That's, that is about market failure. And that's what I think is underlying these things, these things that, we, that we need but that are expensive. Well, then let's, as a society, get together and, and find what these things are and pay, them, pay for them in a way so that the people who work, who work in those sectors um, can have good wages. Um, another example of that, I think, is... I think is um, 
is uh, education. I think in public school education, I think we're going very much in the wrong direction in my country, where we're gradually privatizing it and creating all sorts of inequalities and uh, letting a, a lot of our, a lot of our uh, budget for education get siphoned off for corporate profits. I think that's the wrong direction. We should need to go the direction that Finland is, where they don't even allow private schools during school. You have to, everybody in Finland has to go to the public school, and then in your after hours, if you want to go to private school, then it's okay. And that seems to work, because that gets everyone, meaning I need to make our public school a good school. I think that's a market failure that's because of the community effects of education. Basic income doesn't change that. You need that policy. And that's, I think, the general rule I take for things like this. I think this comes back to Toby's question, the difference between um, um, a UBI that reflects um, a right-wing um, version of politics and a more progressive form of politics is the role of the state. Mm -hmm. So a uh, progressive UBI will embed within the, the overall structure a significant role for the state to provide those other community services like health education and payment for jobs that are necessary but don't fit into um, a regular business model. All right, we've had a few people waiting for a long time over here, so in interest of time, I might get the three questions in one go, and then we can throw them open to whoever on the panel would like to answer them. Um, with the introduction of the UBI, what policies and procedures need to be in place to ensure that the cost of living just doesn't rise up to match that increase? We get 40000 a year. How do we make sure the housing just doesn't jump up to meet that straight away? Just ask. Oh, um, okay, my question. Um, so, I'm Samuel. I have a background more in like technology side of things, um, but I have a deeper interest in this area. So, forgive me if I'm not as well equipped as I hope to be uh, in these questions. Uh, but my question is, uh, I am part of Generation Z, so, um, and I consider myself a global citizen. So, the question is, how universal is this basic income, and? Um, we live in a global economy, and how do we consider people like international students and people who we trade with, like trading education, especially in Australia, that I've had personal experience with? And uh, kind of a smaller question is, um, like, what is the difference between what you're proposing regarding the um, equalization of um, the duties uh, that have been opposed through means of taxation with um, Henry George's single tax movement? And just pass the mic back behind you and we'll get Thanks. Um, yeah, so on the education topic, I'm coming at this from as a primary school, public school teacher. Um, so I'm curious about whether um, I understand the notion that a universal basic income will increase, you know, low wages from, um, in businesses where people are doing essentially unfulfilling jobs like flipping burgers at McDonald's, but for publicly funded jobs that are underpaid for primarily gendered reasons like aged care, early education um, and disability services, things like that, do you think that the model can um, automatically increase those wages? Will the government operate like a business and just increase those wages because people will demand to be paid more or will those jobs still be relatively underpaid because people will just take those jobs up because they see them as intrinsically valuable to society? We don't have to answer those questions in the order they were asked. Anyone want to jump in? Just on the question of would a UBI be inflationary, that's a really important question. Um, we need to look at the evidence. If we look at the um, employment guarantee, again, in the Indian context, which I know well, um, the, the employment guarantee of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment um, Act has been inflationary in some rural areas. But it's also lifted the floor price for labour. So, you know, the extent to which these things cancel one another out, you know, th these are very specific. And this gets back to the point of not only the devil being in the detail, but context is very important. And if the Australian housing market is anything to go on, um, you know, the first homeowners grant can be interpreted as inflationary. The childcare rebate, we have good reason to interpret that as re inflationary. So Australia doesn't have a good kind of history on, you know, pouring money um, in, into people's hands to pay for some of those kind of um, essential services. But it, we'd, ha we'd have to see how it played out. Yeah, 
I mean, how, housing costs are a really big challenge for a basic income when you don't have uh, social housing. Yes, uh, okay, I, I took notes here. Uh, Okay, then the cost of living question, there, there are two aspects to that. The person who asked that, I think, um, wisely separated uh, cost of living in general with housing. Now, cost of living in general, when you're talking about inflation, is actually really not, not that hard of a question. Because uh, people always say, oh, basic income inflation is going to cause it. Basic income is not any special spending. Basic income is government spending. There's nothing s different about it. It's not special spending. It's not a different kind of spending. Whenever the government spends money, it creates inflationary pressure. Money being created by the Treasury, going into the economy, creates inflationary pressure. Uh, whenever the government taxes money and brings it back into the Treasury or sells, uh, sells government debt, which also brings money into the Treasury, it creates deflationary pressure. Now, paying that debt off might later might cause inflationary pressure, but at the moment it creates deflationary pressure. So it has this one tool, by spending money, putting it out, that causes inflationary pressure and these other tools to cause deflationary pressure. What you need to do to stop inflation is to make sure those are balanced. And it's not that simple as, oh, well, taxes this, uh, taxes this and, uh, and, and spending that because you have other things in the economy causing inflation and deflationary pressure, such as the business cycle. So sometimes you need more taxes for a given amount of spending because to counteract these other, these, these other I I inflationary pressures. And other times you need more spending and lower taxes to counteract these deflationary pressures in a down economy. But basic income is just another one of those tools. If you want to have basic income, it needs to be financed by taxes to bring some of that in. So that, that gets rid of the overall inflation issue. Now, but the housing issue, now, you know, is that basic income is not going to cause an across-the-board increase in housing because some people are going to be pay, going to have more money in net. They're going to pay a little more in taxes, but to get a lot more to basic income. Those people have more money, and they can spend more on housing. But there's going to be other people who have less income because they, the amount they receive in basic income is less than the new taxes that they pay for the basic income. Those people have less money. So that, so, and those are the haves and these are the have-nots. So what you're going to see is a uh, greater demand for housing for the have-nots from the have-nots and a greater and a uh, lesser demand for housing or lesser ability to pay for housing by the haves. Now, uh, immediately, well, that's a bad thing in the sense that the have-nots are going to have, pay more, and the haves are going to pay less. But also, there's, there's a good side of that, which is the costs are going to get closer. Uh, so you're going to have less ghettoization and less segregation in housing. However, the bad side, the worst of the bad side, is that that increase in housing eats away at the real value to the basic income of uh, of the recipient. Now, there's two solutions to that. One is to index it for the cost of living of the things. Well, okay, there's three solutions. Well, there's a multiple solution, but there. Uh, one is to index the basic income to the cost of living among net recipients, the cost of housing in poor neighborhoods, not the cost of living in general, because the, that will probably be going down in the wealthier neighborhoods, and you'll be uh, you'll be ignoring the increase in costs in the poor neighborhoods. But um, Another way to do it, it would be to actually subsidize housing, uh, housing for lower income people or to have publicly provided housing. Those might be necessary depending on whether there's a market failure in that system. But another possible solution was what someone, another questioner mentioned, was the single tax. Well, uh, the single tax is what uh, Henry George called the land value tax. Uh, now, uh, even Georgia's today, the single tax is usually not a single tax. It's, it's one tax on land value and another tax on pollution and another tax on, another tax on, uh, uh, another tax on uh, other forms of rent and on use of the broadcast spectrum and so forth. It's actually a multiplicity of taxes. The idea of Georgia's so-called single tax is that you should tax the value of resources, because that takes away the speculative value and the pure rental value of just owning a piece of the earth. Because what you have, one of the reasons that we have such high housing uh, 
prices in places like New Orleans, where I'm from, or Sydney, or London, or New York, is because uh, wealthier people are going in there and buying all the properties, sometimes for speculative reasons, sometimes they have a second, third, or fourth uh, home that they're hardly ever going to use in a desirable city. And this bids up the price for everyone else. If you have uh, if you have a tax on the land value of that, it takes away their incentive to bid those prices up. So those prices go down and there's more houses available for everyone else. So I think, I think this land value tax is a good way to counteract that housing problem. Now, uh, how universal? Now I, think, now, I think what that is getting to is the international issue. My preference would be a worldwide basic income for absolutely everybody. That's my preference. But I realize we're stuck with a nation state system right now. Um, and we're not going to coordinate all 200, all 200 uh, nations of the world to go coordinate and introduce it at the same time together. It's going to have to start in one nation, and that nation is going to have to deal with immigration and import issues, and there'll be some complications of it that will result from that, but I don't think anything that's going to reverse the idea that this whatever country it is that introduces it can show how well it can work. Now, oh, now the last one, it's, it's rare that I get a question that I haven't heard before, but publicly funded, low-paid jobs. Um, well, um, the, with it, that it, when you give the free people who are, so you're talking about things like, like uh, working in, in elder care or something like that, which despite how important everyone agrees this is, we still know we can get away with paying, and, and how difficult the work is, we know we can get away with people with paying very low wages. And the public sector tends to be less responsive than the private sector to, to, uh, to uh, these kind of reactions where people have more power. And, and the, what the person suggested, and this is the thing that uh, I don't hear so much, especially connected with public sector jobs, is this idea that people might keep doing that because they feel a sense of responsibility. Uh, and actually, I think my sister is like this. My sister, uh, my sister has four kids and a stepkid, and she makes thirty-five thousand dollars a year working as a public school teacher. Um, and she could commute to a wealthier uh, school district and make a quite a bit more money. And she doesn't because she feels this. She teaches in the town where her kids went to school and feels this sense of responsibility. And what society is doing is taking advantage of her. And society takes advantage of a lot of do-gooders. It takes advantage of a lot of single mothers and a few single fathers because they're willing to raise children for us without us paying for them. It takes, I think, to some extent, volunteer firemen are being exploited because we, we know they'll do it for free, so we don't pay them as professionals. Uh, there's a lot of people like this. And I'm tempted to say, well, if you all got up and at once and, and, and said, we're not going to do this, for a month until you pay us a decent wage, they'd get the wages and they could go back to these do-gooder jobs at professional wages. And maybe that'll happen. Maybe a big union will, will jump up in. Maybe it won't, but, uh, but it does give them at least more power to move things in that direction. Uh, so basic income can put some pressure in that direction. It's not going to solve that. that we as a society are used to and expect to uh, take advantage of people who say, if nobody else will do it, I will. And, we, it, and I think the solution to that is that we need to stop thinking that way. And we need to start saying, OK, we need to pay equivalent wages for people who are doing this kind of work uh, and people who are doing these other frivolous jobs that, uh, that companies pay for. Um, I think that's something we need to do as a society. And basic income isn't necessarily going to solve that problem. I'd like to thank Gabrielle Ma, Elizabeth Hill and Carl Wilderquist. Thanks. <laughs>